There are many different careers in clinical microbiology, including reading cultures, performing high complexity molecular tests, developing new tests, supervising the laboratory staff, and directing a laboratory. Today, we'll be discussing different careers in clinical microbiology. Some of the topics we will discuss include what qualifications are needed to be a technologist or a director in the clinical laboratory, what are different paths that people take to find their way to working in clinical microbiology, and finally, what is most rewarding about working in clinical microbiology. I'm Alex McAdam, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Clinical Microbiology and Chief of Department of Laboratory Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. We're recording this episode from ASM Microbe here in Atlanta, and I am joined by Ellie Thiel, editor of JCM and consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic, where she directs ser serological testing and testing for sexually transmitted infections. Ellie, how's the meeting going for you? It's really good. It's, it's my favorite meeting. She's holding back because I arrived about five minutes late for this recording. <laughs> We are pleased to have two guests with us. Dr. Alexandra Bryson is Assistant Professor of Pathology and Associate Director of Clinical Microbiology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Alexandra, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me here. And we have Dr. Andrea Prinzi. Andrea is a clinical microbiologist and is now Field Medical Director of U.S. Medical Affairs with Biomary U. For this conversation, we have asked Andrea to go back in time to when she was a clinical microbiologist at Children's Hospital Colorado for 10 years. So I will start with the first question for both of you. A lot of people in microbiology don't know the range of careers that are available on the clinical side. Could each of you tell us how you learned about opportunities in clinical microbiology? And Andrea, we will start with you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me. Um, I actually have a very unusual route to medical laboratory science that I think is unique and, and fun, so I, I always like to share the story. Um, I knew nothing about medical laboratory science when I was in my undergraduate program. I think like most people, I thought I was going to go to medical school. I was doing a biology undergrad. I got nods in the audience. This is relatable. Um, and so. I uh, was working full time to pay for college and, and wanted to be in a hospital setting and knew that I, I always loved infectious diseases. I thought they were really fascinating and, and thought my medical career would go that way. Um, and so I started as a laboratory assistant at Children's Hospital Colorado in microbiology and anatomic pathology. And I was, uh, at the time we didn't have any PCRs, I was making shell vials by hand and doing dishware and looking at all the clinical microbiology work and was like, this is amazing. This is so cool, I didn't know anything about it. And my supervisor at the time was like, would you be interested in becoming a medical laboratory scientist in microbiology? Uh, if you are, we could try a new program here that doesn't exist where you essentially teach yourself clinical micro and you shadow all these bench techs. And in a year and a half, if you're ready to sit and take the you know, board exam through American Society for Clinical Pathology, uh, we can do that. That's a route you can pursue. So I spent a year and a half. Uh, I would work as a, a lab assistant during the day, and then I would, in the evening, shadow some of the texts, and then I would go home and memorize Kahneman's Diagnostic Textbook of Microbiology. Uh, Sorry, did you say the Manual of Clinical Microbiology? Because that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah, that, that one too, for so. sure, 100%. Um, which is a great text, by the way. Uh, and then I was able to sit for the ASCP exam after you know a year and a half, and, uh, and then it went from there. So it kind of had an interesting introduction. I will note that most people don't pursue that path, and I can talk more about that. Tell us a little more about the more usual path. There's formal medical laboratory science programs. Um, folks can start those as a bachelor's degree program, or they can pursue this after they have a bachelor's of science in, in some other discipline. Um, and then that will usually involve uh, some didactic training for about a year or so, and then a clinical rotation through all areas of the laboratory, not just microbiology. So you do chemistry, uh, cytotechnology, hematology, blood banking, microbiology. Um, and you can sit either for a specialty certification in one of those, or you can get a certification in the whole shebang. So I, I'm a micro specialist, um, but you can do any of those routes. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Alexandra, how did you find out about clinical microbiology? What was your path into the field? I was a graduate student doing a PhD in the gut microbiome when I first learned about clinical microbiology. There were two students a few years ahead of me who had been accepted into the CPEP fellowships, which are two-year training programs after your PhD to specifically learn how do you diagnose infections in humans. 
and run those laboratories either in a public health setting or a hospital institution. And since my PhD was part wet bench, but mostly computational biology, I was actually able to sneak out while my scripts were running and work on a project at the um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and attend grand rounds at the University of Pennsylvania's medical school, which was right across the street. I, I just had to walk over one building and could actually get some real hands-on experience with what it's like being a laboratory director and then sneak back before my PI noticed I was, I was gone. Um, so that's how I originally learned about the field. Thank you. Awesome. So we kind of heard how you guys got into it, but let's talk a little bit about your training and qualifications. Um, so Alexandra, let's start with you. What was your training like to be a lab director? And carefully answer this question. <laughs> sure. So PhD from the University of Pennsylvania studying the gut microbiome. And then you really, as long as you have a, a PhD background, you're eligible for the CPEP fellowships. And I applied to those about a year and a half in advance and was fortunate enough to get into a program at the Mayo Clinic with Ellie as one of my mentors. Best program. It, <laughs> absolutely. <all> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they really are strong programs across the board. And so you spend two years really trying to cram in all of the mini med school knowledge that, that you need to really understand what's going on with your patients, understand what you need for a clinical diagnostic test because your research laboratory experiments are nowhere near well controlled as, as your clinical diagnostic laboratory assays actually need to be. So I went straight from my PhD to a CPEM fellowship to an associate director position at the VCU Health System, which is an academic medical center that I've now been there for the last five years. Andrew, you kind of talked about this, but can you reinforce kind of the, the qualifications that you'd need? Yeah, um, there's actually, if anyone's interested in pursuing this, um, ASCP.org has all these different routes you can pursue, which is nice. Um, you could do a more traditional program. You could get a bachelor's in an unrelated science, you know, a, a biological science of some sort, um, and then pursue med tech training or medical laboratory science training. You can have a master's and then pursue certification with some work experience. Um, there's also levels of certification you can get. So if you want to get a specialty certification, that requires a certain amount of time in the lab doing the work across several different disciplines before you can sit for that specialty exam. So there's just a lot of really neat options. And I encourage people, if they're interested, to explore because you can really enter the field at any stage depending on where you may be. It's not, it, you know, it doesn't exclude you if you didn't go to medical technology school. So that gets us through the training and the qualifications. Andrea, let's start with you. Tell us about the work you were actually doing once training was complete. Uh, working in the clinical micro lab at the bench is the coolest thing I've ever done. It's why I'm any good at what I do today. That's a fact. So I actually did, um, when I started in the lab, like I said, we really didn't have a lot of PCR technology in-house, so I got to learn a lot of traditional virology, which was really neat, uh, cell culture for viruses, direct fluorescent antibody staining, things like that. Uh, and then I also trained in all of bacteriology, uh, mycobacteriology or AFB, mycology. And then at the sort of later stage of my career, I got to train in the BSL3 plus and then Ebola lab that we were uh, setting up at the time. And then did a lot of rounding with the ID clinicians at, at work and started two training programs for the uh, clinicians and clinical staff that were rotating through the lab to teach them laboratory methods back. So all sorts of neat things. Thank you. Yeah. Alexandra, what is involved in being a laboratory director? What's the day-to-day, -day, and what are the long-term projects you take on? So day-to-day -day really has a wide array of different activities that you can be involved in. One of the things that's consistent is troubleshooting for the laboratory. So every day in the afternoon, we walk through the laboratory and try to look at some of our complex cases. If there's a patient who has an unusual bacteria that's growing in their bloodstream and we don't have defined antibiotic susceptibility testing that we automatically have the lab able to set up, I will review the literature, try to get a sense of what antibiotics do I think might have activity what antibiotic tests are likely to be accurate or inaccurate. So we're trying to troubleshoot these unusual complex cases 
We also get a lot of questions from physicians. Physicians call all the time saying, why are there two different tests to look for this parasite? And you know, this is, this is surprising to them. And it's like, okay, well, what phase of disease is your patient in? We need to pick what assay we want based on what state your patient is currently in based on their symptoms. And so there's a lot of back and forth conversation. I'm on committees for antimicrobial stewardship. So we're trying to drive antibiotic use in the health system in a direction that is gonna be beneficial to our patients, but also beneficial to inhibiting um, future antimicrobial resistance. So lots of big picture policy that goes into it. We also do a ton of teaching. So medical lab sciences students, medical students, pathology residents, infectious disease fellows. And I think that's one of the most rewarding parts of this job is you are constantly around curious individuals. So I actually wanna back up a little bit. Um, can we talk about the job market real quick? I was actually- Especially well, for um, MLS students in particular. Yeah, I actually, that? I wanted to mention that I was thinking about it. I, I keep mentioning specifically this ASCP route, but that is not the only route. That's the route I am most familiar with, but there are other ways to enter the field. And especially now there's a, a literal crisis in the workforce. We do not have enough medical laboratory scientists. There's a variety of reasons for that. Um, a lot of it having to do with needing to get to people earlier in their education and get them interested in this field and knowing about it sooner. Um, but yes, there's a, an absolute need for this and it is an amazing career path. So I think if it's something you're interested in, talk to people in the field and see uh, where there may, may be opportunities for entry. Um, it may not follow a traditional path at this point because there's a, a definite need for individuals to work in the, the laboratory. So do you want to comment on the job market for lab directors? Sure, yeah, and, and I will also mention that um, to be a lab director, most states also require that you have a board certification, and so I forgot to mention that early on. It's the ABMM exam, and you can take it at the end of your CPAP fellowship, or if you have a PhD and have enough years of experience in a clinical laboratory with leadership skills, then you're able to sit for the exam independently. So there are two different pathways to go there. You do have a little bit of a limited choice in where you go career-wise, just because it's a very niche field. If, if you have a specific geographic region that you're interested, your first job may not be in your specific region. If you, there are different opportunities, whether you go into industry or public health or academic medical centers, but academic medical centers will only have one to three clinical microbiologists typically. And so you're really waiting for people to retire or make a shift in their careers themselves. But I do think people get opportunities to move once you've been in a place for a few years. So if you don't end up in your ideal location, you can always move in the future. Very nice, thank you. So now for the best question, what is your favorite part of being a clinical microbiologist? And we'll start with you, Alexandra. I think the breadth is always gonna keep you interested. There's always a new organism, resistance mechanism, technology, and it's all in the context of this phenomenal community. People are unbelievably supportive. I'm really impressed with our field coming together to work towards common goals. You don't have to be the first to publish a study. Our field really values reproducibility, collaboration across sites. And so it makes it easy for me to call up a colleague and say, I'm struggling with this. What did you do for a solution? Um, also, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute organization has an international impact on how we classify bacteria as resistant or susceptible. And that is a team of clinical microbiologists, physici physicians, and pharmacists who meet every six months to try to move the field forward in a positive way. So I think community, breadth, curiosity, and teaching, that's, that's my favorite part. It's a lot of favorite parts. <laughs> Amazing answer. So I echo everything Dr. Bryson just said. I would also add my favorite part is how important we are. <laughs> um, I think- Amen. Uh, right, right? I, I think it's an underappreciated profession that is one of the most essential components of healthcare and uh, being a part of that is amazing. It's, it's in the clinical lab, it's real time, 
everything you are doing is impacting a patient that day, right then, you are literally saving lives. It's an amazing, amazing career. Doesn't get as much of a spotlight on it because it's not as outwardly facing, although I think that's changing. We've got we some... got a little bit of a spotlight we during do... COVID. Yeah. <laughs> But that, otherwise, no. That was our that was our 15 minutes for sure. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, and we rightfully yeah. came to attention. Yep. Um, Ellie, what is your favorite part of being in clinical oh microbiology? I um, so I'm the program director for our CPEP fellowship, and honestly, one of my favorite things is seeing all the new the new faces, kind of training that future laboratory director, and you know, seeing individuals grow both educationally, but just um, you know, as a, as a person, as a human. And I love, 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 love when a clinician calls and says, this doesn't make sense. And then you talk to them and they're like, oh, this makes sense. Like that for me is the most fulfilling aspect of my job every day. What about you, Alex? I agree with everything that's been said. I agree that the community is important. The clinical significance is important. Working with the clinicians, teaching the fellows is important. I love all of those things. I'm going to call a couple of very little niches that I have found that work for me. One is teaching. I run the course for the medical students at our medical school in microbiology. I absolutely love it. It is under-rewarded by the institution and completely over-rewarded from the students. Um, so that is one thing that I love. Another sort of funny little niche that I have found in clinical microbiology is in the publishing world working for the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, working on the Manual of Clinical Microbiology, and a forthcoming textbook, or book rather, on molecular testing and microbiology. All of those things have been very rewarding to me. I think we bring up a good point. You know, it's like microbiology, we just say microbiology, but there's so many different areas that you can get involved with in clinical microbiology. So um, I think that's important to keep in mind. I agree. Well, thank you. This has been a great conversation. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening.